Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 531. That's 531. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below, all that good stuff, turn the notification bell, you know what the vibe is. And if you're listening via the podcast app and you're hearing my voice nice and clearly, please make sure you leave me a 54321 star review if you're using the Apple Podcast app or if you have any other app that lets you do ratings, do that. Leave a review for me that helps people to know that people are listening to it, bumps me up on the algorithm. And if I ever come to a position where I can go out there and get some ads, I'm sure it will help in terms of fighting my case and proving that I'm the number one cultural commentary podcast in the world. So do that for me. I'll be greatly appreciated. And of course, lastly, support via Patreon is appreciated too. There's two bonus Patreon episodes coming out. They're already done. They're already edited. They're going to come out at the end of the week. So if you're not already subscribed to the Patreon, get involved. It's only one pound equivalent of one dollar per month and you get access to all my bonus content as well as a, a monthly live stream that i'm going to do at the end of the month so look out for that one too i'll go see so notify all the patreon going on that one i'm trying to get up to 20 patrons i don't think i have about 13 if i get up to 20 end of the year that'll be a sick achievement so if you can support the kid go out there and do it obviously i'm not a kid but it's a great thing to say it makes me sound cool so do that anyway and do that anyway help the kid out help the kid out but yeah, apart from that, we are back in the sector. What are we doing right now? For the most part, I'm planning and strategizing or basically, you know, making sure I've got my playlist in the right order so I can go and do a mix sometime. I'm hoping to do it. By the time you hear this podcast, I'm hoping to do it sometime Thursday morning early. So I plan to do it like from one to like six record it or maybe do it live actually maybe do it live one to two or one to three record the last half an hour last three hours come back home sleep bang get to work and then do it all over again that's going to be the plan going forward it's going to be a bit rough it's going to be a bit hard but i think i'm going to go and try and do it because i want to just get involved and see if i can quickly record a mix whilst everyone is kind of like you know scrapping around doing whatever they're doing so that's basically the plan for me going forward um, and then the other plan is then the following week when I have a spare day free, I'm then going to head out to Paris Studios again and record or maybe I don't. Yeah, I have to record this because I'm, I'm going out on New Year's Eve. But the plan is to record hopefully a three hour minimum stream. If not, maybe it depends how long I can record because my computer and my OBS sometimes doesn't let you record for too long. But if I can record for long, the plan is to go out and do a let's say three and a half hour stream and have that basically playing as the clock strikes 12 so people have stuff to basically celebrate and dance to um as they kind of welcome in 2022 that's basically what i'm trying to do going forward just to have a bit of like you know mix up on the content obviously show off some of my djing skills and just have a bit of fun really in it why not it's the end of the year let's celebrate and let's kind of go out with a bit of a bang so if you're looking out for that stuff or if you've been thinking oh where's his stream where's his dj mixes he ain't done those things in a while i'm going to be doing a lot more of those going forward especially now that we have this news that you know we're probably going to be in some version of a, of a lockdown or some version of a circuit breaker probably within the next two weeks or so or maybe a week so um it probably is the best time to do that because i won't be distracted there will be no clubs to go to i'll only be working really so why not just use my free time where i'm not going to the gym where i'm not reading or i'm not trying to learn new things to try and basically go and do the thing that i really enjoy which is obviously playing out which i haven't been able to do a lot of the time because life has kind of changed really in it circumstances have changed which has been a bit of a bummer but like I mentioned in the previous podcast, I think collectively as global citizens, we've kind of been, I've kind of, I don't know, this whole period, I think has toughened us all up. We're not really as um, emotionally fragile or mentally fragile as we were maybe prior to COVID. And I think if this would happen to me prior, if I hadn't, if I was in a position where I was getting booked to play bars and plot clubs like I was before, you know, three times per week, every single week, and it suddenly got taken away, I think I would be a lot more gutted then you know then i am now do you know what i mean now it's just kind of one of those things where it's like yes it's a bit of a gutting thing but considering what other people are going through it's not that bad of a situation do you know what i mean i shouldn't be complaining that much the fact that i'm still able to kind of pay my way cover my rent make sure i've got enough money to eat out get put, put clothes on my back and go out a few times that's probably enough do you know what i mean 
all those other extra bits and bobs again even though it was great to do i can do it another time and also i've got the option if i want to to go and play and do little streams and stuff which is not the same thing don't get me wrong but it's still a good way to kind of flex my muscles show off a little bit have some fun play some music really loudly you know all those kind of things you kind of get from playing in clubs you can kind of replicate it to some extent when you're doing streams especially if you're just in it for the love of the music you just want to share your tunes you want to display your mixing skills your selection skills your taste level all this sort of stuff you can kind of replicate that feeling over there and then again in the future when things change because I'm, I'm sure they will because you know i came from basically playing no places to suddenly playing three or four in a week i'm sure my fortunes will change over time especially if i keep putting my content out there maybe someone will notice me and be like oh yeah we like you then that might change in the future but i'm just basically especially in covid times i'm just taking every day as it comes and putting my best foot forward um and just basically you know reacting to whatever happens or whatever comes my way when it comes my way but try not to freak out i think that's the best way to deal with things i think in that regards um and then what else may night I haven't played in like two weeks it feels like maybe a month it feels like because we've been hit with covid and no we've been hit with covid and also i think the games that we were meant to play got cancelled because the other team have covid so it's basically been a covid pandemic in football but for some reason we've been one of the unlucky teams that have been able not been able to play whereas other teams like chelsea and stuff have been basically twisted their arm to play um the the pfa or the english football federation came out and just basically said we're not gonna we're basically not gonna cancel the games until basically it's governmented it's government mandated so another illustration that as much money as football doesn't make it's just another realization that they're still glorified employees at the end of the day if their boss tells them to jump they have to jump do you know what i mean they don't really have any say in anything even if they have young children even if they're looking after people that are at risk the you know the football federation is like nah or the English Football Federation Association, whatever they're called, right? Is it FA? Whatever, yeah. Um, they're like, nah, you're not you're not you're not not playing the games. You have to play the games. This is it. Like you know, until the government mandates it, we're not gonna change it, we're not gonna cancel any games, we're gonna postpone it. Um and that's basically it. And I think the only way they are postponing it now going forward, I think, is if a certain number of players get COVID, right? First team players, I think so. Because then you can't draft the under twenty threes before then. But if the first team squad, like a lot of them, like the majority go under or they get sick then usually they have an option where they can basically change those but apart from that it doesn't really exist in terms of changing those fortunes going forward but it's a bit of a mad one isn't it, it really is a bit of a mad one and um yeah let's just get on the podcast and we've got many things to talk about many bits of news so if you've first time around here make sure you get yourself a little drink a little whatever tickle whatever you need and let's just dive on deep to all these little topics that i have collected up across the waves of the internet so first things first um in england we have great news it feels like somewhat great news basically the calm before the storm um basically the carrot before we get slapped in the back of the head but this news courtesy of the bbc says covid no new restrictions in england before christmas boris johnson so if you're asking why last year we had these last minute restrictions that got put into place where effectively it cancelled Christmas, it cancelled people being able to go see their families, you know, rule wise, I think if you didn't give a shit, you'd still win anyway. But it basically made the mood around Christmas a little bit dour. New Year's Eve was probably equally as bad. Restaurants and bars closing, just a, a whole kind of dour and sad environment all around. I think that's when you saw those videos of people going to central London and recording videos of just like desolate kind of streets within that place area which are usually jam-packed full of people and it's just sad all around and again because of the flip-flopping too with boris johnson the fact that it was christmas was on it was off then it was off again people were thinking we didn't want to, we didn't want to repeat of it again this year but with the revelation of these pictures that are showing these you know government officials basically doing the opposite of what they told us last year during lockdown right they're attending parties they're doing work meetings with loads of people with no social distancing no mask uh, you know all this mad thing that they're doing which is basically showing them up to be the hypocrites that they are or that we've always known them to be it did feel like it would be political suicide if boris johnson decided to enact some restrictions before christmas it didn't seem like the logical or the smart thing to do again the guy isn't the sharpest tool in the box but you know still i don't think he'd be that dumb to basically hand his opponents or hand his detractors you know an easy thing to basically bat him over the head with so there was always the case that they were gonna allow us to have a, a normal christmas quote unquote and i don't think people would have listened anyway if they would have put you know put any restrictions in place but from what i've heard or from the rumors going around what they're gonna do now is that they're gonna let us have christmas and then i think on the 20 
7th, I think, if I look at my phone, that, yeah, I think what they're saying is that probably the 27th or 28th is then when the new restrictions will come into place. Obviously, if the numbers are good, they won't need to do it, but if the numbers are bad, the plan that they're probably trying to do is, like, let let us have a Christmas, because obviously it's too late now to in next restrictions that are going to make any meaningful change. And then if the numbers get worse over the weekend coming up, before or during Christmas, they then can enact the you know emergency restrictions in place for the twenty seventh onwards. By then, Christmas is over. New Year's Eve and New Year's Day it feels like in the UK again. I've got some conflicting reports. I've got a um, I've just received an email from like a ticketing platform called Dice. I think or what is it Dice? Yeah, Dice. I've just sent me a, a promotional email where they're like oh um this is one of the best times to buy new year's eve tickets da, 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 da. don't get me wrong they're a bit compromised because you know they have to sell those tickets and that's how they make their money so they're going to push that but then there's another report i'll go on and read later on that says basically new year's eve and new year's day tickets have basically slumped since these new um since this new variant has come about people have just basically got cold feet and um so I've, but anyway I, I think in general if you'd ask UK residents, I don't know if, it, if it's the worldwide, I guess it's worldwide. If if worldwide, depending on where you are, let me know in the comments, regardless of where you are in the world, if your government asked you, you had to sacrifice either Christmas or New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, which one would you go for? I guess most people would go for sacrificing New Year's Eve and New Year's Day for Christmas, right? Because Christmas is basically a chance for you to get to see your family, your close family, your extended family, your friends, whoever, right? That's a time where you kind of all sit around a table and have a drink and or eat something, share, pre you know, exchange presents, blah, 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 have a drink or whatnot. Whereas New Year's Eve and New Year's Day is more so like a hedonism thing, right? You just use that opportunity to get absolutely wrecked it's not necessarily a wholesome event it's not necessarily a time for you to connect with people um you know um you, whatever it may be um so definitely people would go for christmas i'd think so so it makes sense that they did it this way so it's a quite a clever strategy in that regard but anyway let's hear from the man himself big boris what they call him um they call him uh Poundland, the pound shop, uh churchill in it or whatever something along those lines but let's see what boris has to say regarding it himself Good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to update you quickly on the latest COVID situation. There's no doubt that Omicron continues to surge with Hate speed, voice. unlike anything we've seen before. The situation remains extremely difficult, but I also recognise that people have been waiting to hear uh, whether their Christmas plans, your Christmas plans, are going to be affected. So what I can say tonight is that naturally we can't rule out any further measures after Christmas, and we're going to keep a constant eye on the data We'll do whatever it takes to protect public health. But in view of the continuing uncertainty about several things, severity of Omicron, uncertainty about the hospitalisation rate or the impact of the vaccine rollout and the boosters, we don't think today that there is enough evidence to justify any tougher measures before Christmas. And we continue to monitor Omicron very closely and if the situation deteriorates, we will be ready to take action if needed. And what this means is that people can go ahead with their Christmas plans, but the situation remains finely balanced. And I would urge everyone to exercise caution, to keep protecting yourselves and your loved ones, especially the vulnerable, and remember to keep following the guidance. Wear a mask indoors when required to do so, keep fresh air circulating, and take a test before you visit elderly or vulnerable relatives. So if you have not done so already, then please drop everything, find a walk-in or go online and make an appointment and get boosted now. Thank you very much and happy Christmas. He was really struggling to read that towards the end, didn't it? But yeah, that's the official message there from our own Prime Minister, our Lord and Saviour, Boris Johnson. Um, yeah, interesting times going ahead. I'm not really too sure it's going to make any difference with this announcement. I think most people were going to do what they were going to do anyway when it comes to Christmas, especially in this country, especially after the year or the last few months that we've had over here with the mixed messaging and the just poor leadership overall. I think people just basically had enough, like I'm going to do what I want to do. So, you know, it's nice to get it, obviously, in writing and some respect. It's nice to get it uh, vocalized in that way. But I guess going forward, we're just going to have to find, figure it out on our own, really, isn't it? Um, this is an article courtesy of Bloomberg talking about the rapid rise of Omicron in Denmark. 
Um, I only mentioned it because obviously everyone's kind of Omicron crazy. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, my brain hasn't been broken about COVID like Joe Rogan does. And I don't really thinking about this thing all, all the time. If anything, I've only started reading or rereading things now in the last, what, two months. It feels like I took like a, per, I, yeah, I took like a, um, I did, I made a concerted effort over the last 18 months to basically avoid any real news and you know updates and stuff regarding covid for the most part because before that i was glued onto this little i got a list i joined a list a twitter list or something that i think the guy um what's his name i forgot his name someone on, on social media a really prominent person that's been on joe rogan a few times he shared this list of people that he follows on twitter who are just basically experts from both sides of the fence right people that are super vax people that are, are, are for the vaccine people that aren't for the vaccine and basically they provide loads of you know papers and studies and data they're just talking about covid every single day it feels like these people but it's a separate feed so when you go in your twitter profile you have like a, a feed where you can so you know your main feed your main timeline whatever it is and then you have a tab at the top that basically lets you switch between different sort of lists of twitter people you follow and i was following that all the time i was on the coronavirus subreddit i was on the coronavirus uk subreddit i was on forums i was checking blogs i was going on instagram for it like i was just doing too much about a year and a half ago and then i made a concerted effort over the last it feels like maybe two four six months not really too sure maybe it was six months to basically cut all of that out and not follow it at all to that extent apart from maybe just going bbc news and just seeing what's on the front page because before i was digging deeper into that i was going into many 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 rabbit holes and okay again i just don't think it's helpful in general because number one there's very little that you and i can do in terms of shaping public policy when it comes to covid we can't do jack shit if the government do tell us to jump we do basically have to jump especially if it's tied to something that basically allows us to um you know exercise our freedoms be able to make money and shit like them we just have to do it if you work in a school and you're a single parent and you have to look after a bunch of kids and they tell you you have to get jabbed up in order to work in the school even though your views are, are completely opposed to it, you're going to do it for the sake of your family. Or you would, you would imagine you would. So I think that's part of the reason why I was like, you know what, this is useless. This doesn't really empower me. It doesn't help the situation. If anything, it just stresses me out. It makes me more worried. It gets me angry. I couldn't sleep a lot that during that time either because I was kind of thinking about all this shit. It, kind of, it, it doesn't give you terror. It just makes you restless because you keep thinking, why isn't anyone doing anything? Why aren't things changing? Do, 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 look, I think this could go bad. And then you start playing out all these scenarios in your head some of which come true right like you can kind of i think the good thing about following the news when it comes to covid that closely is that you usually are able to kind of figure out when things are going to happen like you can kind of judge when there's going to be restrictions imposed you can kind of get an idea of when countries are going to get added onto red list you can kind of get an idea when there might be an uprising in terms of political protests and whatnot so everything uh, protests to do with kind of um you know public health policy and whatnot people being against the vaccinations you can kind of gauge it the more information you, you kind of absorb naturally but again i think in terms of your overall mental well-being let's not say mental health because again i think that's an overused phrase but let's say your overall mental well-being i don't think it's beneficial or good for people to be glued to watching 24-hour news programs or stations or publications because for the most part even if it's on print even if places like bloomberg they're usually you know the reason why these pages exist and they kind of you know word the titles the way they do is because they want you to basically get agitated and annoyed and angry so you can click onto the article so it's not really done in order to share or to inform it's done to basically enrage so you can engage you know what i mean so this is what it is anyway this Bloomberg article courtesy, yeah, just a quote from Bloomberg, sorry, titled Denmark's Omicron surges a warning to the rest of the world. I thought i quickly read out regarding everything that's going on right now. It says, yeah, Denmark is seeing the number of people infected with Omicron variant of COVID-19 double every second day, offering a glimpse of a development that is probably unfolding throughout Europe. The Nordic country can offer valuable insights into what to expect from Omicron as it has Europe's most rigorous screening program with a high level of testing and variant screening of all PCR tests. That explains why Denmark has reported a high number of Omicron cases in Europe. Uh, Trulis Libic, chair of the Danish SARS-CoV-2 Variant Assessment Committee said. So it seems like what they're actually saying is that because Denmark are aggressive or the, you know, are aggressive in their testing and their screening, that's why they've been able to identify so many cases of um, what you call the Omicron. But maybe because we're not as aggressive with our testing and screening over here in the UK, that's why our numbers are being underreported. That's not an actual good thing, is it? 
anyway it continues it says the nordic country can offer valuable insights sorry i said um denmark is not a hotspot this is a quote denmark is not a hotspot for omicron compared with any other european country um lily beck lily bike so he said in an interview on friday um, i'm quite sure that what we are seeing now in denmark is also happening in neighboring countries and other european countries he says the first Omicron infection in Denmark was detected in a small sample um, from November 22nd. Since then, 1,280,000 cases have been recorded and Omicron represented 4.5% of the 5% of all COVID infection cases in the country. It says continues here, while based on limited data that could be skewed, the information from the st from the state and serums institute also shows that almost 75% of those infected by Omicron have received two doses of COVID-19 vaccine, which again goes to me to tell me and informs me that all of these restrictions that we put into place, such as locking down and closing different parts of our economy are basically pointless and useless. There needs to be another option that we kind of enact, especially now that we've done it before, because we've that's the thing. When we, when we were first inundated with COVID, we didn't know what to do. We we're all scared. Cool. You do whatever needs to be done because you're worried and you're seeing where people drop dead, left, right and center. But now we've got like a year and a half, two years experience under our belt. Why aren't we trying other solutions to make it work, especially now that we know of all the kind of knock on effects of putting people in sort of like prolonged lockdown and, and limiting their ability to see family and friends and all this sort of, we know what that, what that does to people so if that's the case why don't we look for another option that can, can maybe be a better way forward or maybe just kind of grow up as humans just decide hey we can't save everybody and we just have to live with this because that's another conversation i don't feel like is said that, i don't think that's a conversation that's get had that gets had enough i don't, I don't know why it is i really don't know why um maybe it's because you know we're, we're living in a kind of an individualistic society to some extent right where basically everyone's life is ridiculously important everyone's kind of like the main character in their own movie um so maybe that's why in that respect we don't really talk about you know the idea that maybe this is just the way it's going to be for a, you know a prolonged period of time and if that is the case we need to have uncomfortable conversations about just because you know some people get it doesn't mean we have to doesn't mean we can save or not should but doesn't mean we can save everybody regardless you know what i mean if everyone got it and we could still save them some people would pass away still just because this is how it is it's how viruses work they basically affect people in different ways it continues here it says lab studies conducted by the vaccine manufacturers pfizer inc and BioNTech sc have indicated that the third dose may restore protection against the omicron variant yeah i bet they, i bet it has done you, you went and asked the people who make the vaccine to run tests on if the if the booster helps to actually be like oh god almighty man honestly absolutely crazy but yeah would that inform people probably not i think most people myself included are covid vac covid um fatigued i just don't i don't say i don't care but i'm just tired of these solutions i'm tired of the approach i'm tired also of the recklessness that people have i feel like i've under a friendship group that i have at the moment that's just it feels like every other week someone, someone's catching it and then they're shocked that they got it and then they're making it all your business and b blowing up your line telling asking you where to get tests if you've got one it's like look if you're gonna i've always been a big believer and this again and maybe i'm in the minority here but i've always been a, i've always never liked kind of the kind of dude that would kind of you know hook up with a girl not use a condom impregnate her and then she has a baby and then he kind of just runs away and doesn't have doesn't want anything to do with it i've never really thought that's kind of fair and i've always kind of um abided by the idea that if you're a man you should just kind of the one of the important things about being a man is being able to kind of um live with the consequences of your actions without getting other people involved or without roping other people in to come and save you like if you make a mistake or you f up you should be able to stand on your two feet and just take whatever's going to come at you in terms of karma in terms of consequence and i think if you hook up with somebody and you decide as a grown adult to not use a condom and just trust her word that she's going to you know get rid of it or whatnot and she doesn't you still should do the right thing and be there for the kid. You know what I mean? You can hate the mum as much as you want, but you still got to be there for and, and look after the kid. Eventually, you have to kind of love her too because she's an extension of him or he's basically an extension of her or the kid, whatever. But I've never really kind of liked that. And I think people nowadays, it feels like are just abandoning all responsibility. They're kind of just not listening to what the government's saying in first place, right? Cool. And then they're kind of doing their own thing, cool. Then when their own thing doesn't go right, they're like, oh, no one told me. It's like, Number one, you weren't listening to people that are telling you. Number one, you did your own thing, so you decided with your adult brain to do that. If that's the case, take whatever comes your way. 
don't rope everyone else into your madness but people love doing it i don't know what it is about humans we have this kind of um um need to kind of get people roped into our drama vortex it's just like chill out man enough we already got all the, and it's even worse nowadays i feel like when it comes to covid because it feels like there's enough information like now nah, i'm not telling you anything new i know this is boring conversation i really do apologize we're gonna move on off this but there's nothing new really out there in terms of information like to do with how to protect yourself i mean that respect but all the information is already out there so if you're not doing it you're just not doing it because you don't want to not because you don't know so then just turn back around and kind of use that as an excuse it's a little bit lame you know what i mean that's what i don't like about that one but you know what do i know and what do people care about what i have to say and then there's this really cool article courtesy of ra which i'm definitely going to bookmark because it's basically their version of their way of basically informing all of us in terms of <clears throat> what's the different the different restrictions exist around <clears throat> sorry around the rest of the world when it comes to obviously dance music and whatnot in club culture and this is basically tied to covid 19 latest portugal to close to this but it basically has got a list of of um countries where you know restrictions have changed or things are being put into place and the basically the major highlight here see at the top is that portugal is closing clubs from december 25th which is brutal but makes sense sweden and scotland have retired restrictions around events too and the uk chancellor rishi sunak has pledged one billion for hospitality sector in england which i think a lot of people in my timeline who are part of the hospitality industry are not happy with whatsoever so that's another topic for another day it says here tuesday december 31st prime minister Antonio Costa has brought forward the closure of clubs and nightclubs from June to December 25th from the initial date of January 2nd so they were gonna have a time to basically party during Christmas or during bank holiday heading into New Year's Eve and then closing the second but I guess the situation is that bad over there like no nah, no nah, we have to do 25th so that's gonna cripple if not kill some spots over there because that's probably one of their better seasons or better times right I'd imagine in Portugal with the food that they got out there and stuff around Christmas time not being able to open those places will be brutal in it not food I mean like restaurants and whatnot not food in clubs but you know what I mean but it also got me thinking the funny thing especially on my instagram now some people who i follow some people are just find on the discovery page but a lot of the people who i follow who i'd say are in the like lower b tier of like djs and whatnot they're all scrambling to find gigs and i think the places that i've seen they're going to is places like budapest i've seen people throwing parties like normal hungary obviously ukraine um sorry so i said budapest right hungary so budapest czech republic ukraine I see people go to Mexico. Tulum seems to be a really popular destination to go to when you want to rave and party. Obviously, places like Bali and other spots in Southeast Asia. But it looks like all the BAT people from sure who are landlocked in Europe and can't go overseas that far are scrambling to get to places. And either they've scrambled. I've seen a couple of people scramble over here to London to kind of stay here for maybe a prolonged period of time, especially if you just want to stay here for 90 days or whatnot. You can just basically get that, get your money and kind of bounce after the fact. Um, and then I've seen people, of course, scramble into central europe eastern europe to just keep the gigs alive and it's just interesting i find that hilarious all at all times the fact that no other musician or no other kind of artist within the music space you would say has any possibility or ability to kind of play in front of a crowd when there's a global lockdown right they just can't do it there's nothing that you can't transport equipment it's just no it doesn't seem any it doesn't seem like anyone does it it seems that people might be willing to go and busk or to go and stand in the middle of a park and do it but it doesn't seem like people are willing to put on a show if you're just an artist or a rapper or a singer or whatnot or you know what i mean you're just not going to do it but it seems like for whatever reason the, the djs feel like they're the most i won't say entitled but they feel like they're the most deserving of an ability to to kind of make money and play a gig that they basically play wherever and uh, those videos of in the last couple of years of like nina kravitz playing some fucking billionaire saudi funded party somewhere in the middle of a desert where people are dancing in the hula hoop is always going to be sitting into my brain yeah i mean it's just like so like it, it's just it's, it's an illustration of just like these guys just won't give up you know? not give up but give up is the wrong word to use um for them the party never stops do you know what i mean there is no such thing as like a stop it doesn't happen if the world stops they find a way to keep on going if some especially if somebody's willing to pay for them to go somewhere it doesn't matter how hot the countries are they're gonna make it happen and i think people have basically been able to see through some people especially when you look at the likes of you know nina kravis maybe not so because i think she's always been a bit of a free spirit does things her own way but you look at the people like the nastiers and some other 
that are barely business techno people who I guess always feel like they had a favorable reputation online. They've definitely got a different taste from the fans and the customers out there. Who again, who I think who have been, it's been, it must be annoying too if you follow those guys because usually you only follow them because you want to see clips of them playing in front of big crowds. You want to get two nineties, and then suddenly you're having to kind of listen to them talk about politics, listen to them talk about you know public health and stuff. You're just like what. Do you know I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Listen to them kind of rabbit on about some conspiracy theory they kind of read on the back of a fucking milk cart and something. You just don't understand what's going on. You can't get your head around it. And then when you see them doing something that you obviously know is dumb and then come back on social and kind of faint ignorance or pretend like it wasn't, you look at them like, what? And I get it. I completely, completely get it. I really, really do. Um, which is why I think most people should probably put you know do away with following those kind of people i think in the most part because it's not really helpful in any way shape or form then next year courtesy of resident advisor we have news about e1 my new sort of favorite e-club i think so far in london i was never really the biggest fan of e1 mostly because of the crowds of course it's a little bit you know you know what the, if you've been e1 you know what i mean about the crowd but it feels like i don't know if they got a new event booker if they've got a new manager there if it's under new manage if it's new under new management overall it feels like they've purposely decided to tilt or to pivot their programming more in line with kind of what's going on overall in terms of the dance or the club scene overall i think in london and instead of just having the overall bait big names they also kind of do nights with the likes of Budokais and you know other little kind of small promotion underground kind of groups who are doing some really big things that make us have really big moves and kind of influencing culture in that kind of level on a really big state on a really in a really big way too and i think they've kind of noticed that they've noticed the appeal of it and they've also kind of noticed the idea that it's a good idea to kind of get those kids who will probably wouldn't want to go to e1 normally to go there experience how great of a club it is maybe you know like the transport you know links next to it or just like in generally how it's set up and maybe they'll come back for another night that they might not be interested in previously i think it's a really clever tactic and now they've announced their 2022 program courtesy of ra it says the following e1 has announced eight shows for 2022 which might be a bit premature considering what's going on but still why not it says the events from june 20, june 2nd through to april 23rd include performance by todd turge uh todd turge was funny we saw him play where at, um uh what's that thing called something studios it doesn't matter what it's called right but something studios and it was interesting like he was really nervous about covid he had to they had to put a fan next to him or something so it blow the air away from him he didn't want to get next to people and he basically ran away went before he set finish because he got cold feet and thought he was going to get infected by it so he seems to be a little bit of a fun guy in that regard um it seems that they've got helena health playing at january 29th gene on earth playing february 4th jeff mills playing march 12th that would be pretty sick to see jeff mills playing that main room with that wall of sound with that with those wall of speakers they have on the kind of on our right hand side of your crowd or the DJ's left hand side that's going to be sick on January 21st it's seminal drum and bass label Exit Records will celebrate its 18th birthday party in E1 a few weeks later March 5th Welsh Festival Gotwood will host a pre-festival session with Margaret Dyer Gas Creelwood and Ferrer and more um, to ring into 2022 there will also be a New Year's Eve and a New Year's Day events with Percolate featuring Object DJ Rhyme and Love Juice respectively so yeah they've gone pretty crazy with the lineups as you can see here they've kind of again nice little mixture of people playing just from the little clips I got here right you've got uh, Transmission Pie of course with Helen and Half. you've got VTSS who obviously I think lives here now so that makes more sense Mama Snake is going to be there the person that I blame for the flipping comments on social media get on so the comments on resident advisor being taken away because of her fucking interview let's actually see if i can get that interview up on here because that interview was wild she did like a ra mixed review she did like ra mix and then when you do an ra mix you get obviously a little interview that you do where they kind of basically ask you your inspiration about the misc and make oh, excuse me misc they ask you about your inspiration behind the mix and what went into it blah blah and you know, your frame of mind and whatever it's just a kind of run of the mill flipping uh interview and she took the opportunity to just go on some mad tangent that i think people didn't react too well at all in the comments and if i'm not mistaken that was the point when the comments then started the conversation then started to happen really um about how you know toxic the comments are and all this sort of nonsense but you know i think she did it to herself and 
but it's annoyingly the part, annoying part of it is that she's a fucking phenomenal DJ. Like she's really, 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 really good. Like scary good. So that's the annoying part of it. It's like, oh man, you took away one of the best features on the site that I used to kind of live by and kind of visit all the time. Because I remember, because I think people don't people don't remember, but people forget the RA comments were sometimes better than some of the content they put up back in the day and the features and articles they did before were amazing some of those old writers some of those old event reviews like from back in the day they legitimately were the ones that those event reviews from you know again pre-2018 were some of the reasons why I decided to go to places like Robert Johnson right why I even decided to go to places like Burger in the first place because those reviews were basically made you feel like you were there the, the, they definitely made you feel FOMO just through words on a screen. No no videos or anything, no crazy pictures, just words, someone describing how amazing it was. And suddenly here you are booking a flight on flipping Ryanair um, to go to these far flung places that you have never visited prior just to go in club, which is pretty insane. Um, but then again, the comment section was sometimes equally as, as good because sometimes if there was a really strong article, some people would say, hey, if you're actually going to go to Frankfurt, don't go here. This place is played out. Don't go to this place. So you get all these really, really amazing um, recommendations. And it, it, I feel it was even more powerful when it came to the DJ poll times or the best tracks. So when it came to DJ poll time, usually, of course, they'd only, I think, let you vote if you actually went to the event. Um, on RA, which is a good way to kind of, uh, you know, get out some of the bots. And then what they would do is obviously they'd have the DJ listed from like, you know, from the bottom to the top, whatever, or top to bottom, whatever. But in the comments, people would make their own list or they'd kind of say, oh, this guy should be on there. This girl should be on there. And because they had an upvote and downvote system, people could basically say, yeah, well, I agree with this one. He should be on the list too. And you could go in the comments and you could get an alternative list as to who people think are their local heroes, who people think are people they've they seen play out who don't get enough shine. And then suddenly you've got these two amazing lists. You've got these lists of proper punters customers who are going to these shows and deciding hey we really like dixon so we're gonna vote him the four-time champ and there's other people who've gone to shows too thinking you know i've never seen this dixon guy play but i like this person this person this person i thought that was always a good thing man and it really sucks that it's gone because if anything it took away all the soul from ra and now it's basically a shell of itself to just kind of just effectively they've turned into mix mag or a dj mag right which just post their own um content that they put together but there's no real community aspect of it whatsoever it's just gone completely gone which is ironic too because i went to a community sort of sit down thing about for ra and i was contacted by one of their community managers which is interesting because they don't have a community they might say the community exists on social media comments but that's not really where ra comments that's not where ra social uh, that's not where ra community should be it shouldn't be splintered across facebook flipping instagram and twitter of replies you know what i mean because they, they don't engage with them either because you know they're pretty toxic in that regard but if you cultivate it in one space i think it would have worked pretty perfectly in my opinion but what do i know but yeah this is the interview with mama snake this is from 2018 and i remember she just went off on mad tangents so let's want this going one first of all Again, I wish the comments were still on there, but they're not. It says here, um, so RA asks her, what have you been up to recently? She says, staying into a new way of life with a full-time job, less going out and more environment, sorry, more envi involvement in, in areas beyond music. It's a puzzle right now, figuring out which things to be involved in and what to let go of in order to have the capacity to do things that feel right. The white head just, again, this is a perfect, great answer, right? In terms of just what's going on in the head, as she's balancing it. And she just jumps into this second paragraph. The white heterosexual male dominated world we live in still makes me pretty tired and is the cause of a lot of debates amongst my friends. Like, huh? That's not recent, but obviously still relevant. Something I want to address, which isn't very easy to context or put in it out of this mix, but who gives a fuck? I think that's what it means, right? Um, the idiotic things anyone who is not straight white guy still has to put up with is unreal. The excuses for not working towards a more inclusive world and paying attention to one's own privilege, especially in the music industry, are old school, outdated, and fucking ridiculous. It's still premeditated. So it's still, still permeated by privileged blindness, which I find really frustrating. Recently, I've become a bit better at staying in the uncontrollable awkwardness that arises when you speak up. For instance, when someone says something like, senseless, like we book quality of agenda or it's not to be sexist, racist, homophobic, we joke good people, we good contentions, but we have to still sell tickets, follow the hype, insert the lame business mindset related and go here and so on. The list of examples are endless. It's hard 
hard to have these conversations many people head straight into defense mode and then nothing changes it's hard to make someone engage in change if they believe that they do nothing wrong not listening to and not giving a voice to those who are massively underrepresented underrepresented remains an issue at its fault as a result as a result sorry it's just it's basically a whole entire note that she had on her phone that she just basically lumped in there that had no context whatsoever, just shoved in there. Um, it's not really a conversation. It doesn't really have anything to do with what the question is about. But I guess in terms of if you ask somebody what they've been up to recently and they say something like that, maybe just because it's not what you want to hear, it might just be quite accurate in that respect. So maybe I should take that back and say, actually, it is quite accurate because they asked her what she's been up to recently and she told you, I've been thinking about white, heterosexual, male-dominated world we live in. It still makes me feel pretty tired <laughs> it's just like wow it's heavy shit um so it's continuity it says i've lost patience with some areas and realized that for me to properly apply myself i needed to regroup turn frustration into action seems like more people are starting to realize that these things sorry that things need to change and to drive change you need to actually do shit and recognize your own responsibility i'm trying to stay optimistic still tired though or as we say in danish i don't need to pronounce that tight af it Trait F piss, trait F piss, or trait F pice. I'm not sure you pronounce that one. Continues. It says, um, how where was the mix recorded? Da, da, da. She continues to tell me about the idea behind the mix. <sighs> Try to pack whatever I could the perfect night for letters and lads. But yeah, I thought that was one of the interviews that I thought um I knew would actually uh cause a little bit. Oh yeah, this is the one, yeah. I think people got annoyed as well because she's a doctor or something. So she says here, yeah, question, how do you find a balance between your work as a DJ and your life as a touring DJ? Sorry, your life as your, how do you find a balance between your work as a doctor and your life as a touring DJ? Do the, do the two play into each other? She says, well, I don't exactly know yet. I guess both worlds consist of a significant amount of nighttime affairs. However, a pretty noticeable difference is that my colleagues at the hospital are sober. Haha, <laughs> hopefully. Where there is some inherent meaningfulness in working as a doctor that make, gives me a great sense of purpose. It also is a profession that where you need to be completely honest about who, what you, what you can and cannot do and also help when you need it. Everyone is working towards helping others and you need to stop learning. So, and you never stop learning. It's pretty sick. I graduated in January and I spent a year up until now recently focusing on music alone and it was honestly quite disheartening, not the right thing for me to only be occupied with music related matters. I pretty much already knew that beforehand but wanted to test it out anyway that did enable me to travel the world and see people that I care about who live far away, which has only been lovely and something I hope to keep doing. So she's clearly suffering some sort of you know career crisis maybe you know you, you finally you've been working so hard to this one goal to be a doctor you you're in school for ages you spend a bunch of money sleepless nights don't get to see many of your friends because you're always studying always working then you finally get there and you're like oh this isn't actually what i wanted and also the music stuff that you so greatly enjoy you make music and you mix and people book you in places you start to realize also that that situation in its current guise isn't also what you like too so i can understand why she flipped out but god man this this interview was like a fucking molotov cocktail to those comments because they went absolutely crazy and it went so crazy like i said they completely ridded the entire platform of them and i, I gotta be honest man the, the place has never recovered since then it legitimately has never ever recovered and it's pretty sad to see but you know what can you do next on it this is courtesy of mix mag it says NY ticket sales see dramatic dip amidst skyrocketing Omicron cases. Like I mentioned previously at the top of the show, I have conflicting in bits of information. I have one promo email that went out to my, or what, that I received in my inbox a, a couple of minutes ago from a company ticketing company called dice to basically said oh this is a great time to get nye nyd flipping tickets um things are selling out you know the usual nonsense you get in emails but the truth of the matter is i would imagine they're not because i've actually been outside i've been outside to a different country obviously i went to berlin recently i've been to places outside of london i've went to manchester and liverpool recently i've been clubbing obviously here in london and i've said many times before that it's obvious for me to, to from, you know from my point of view that the attendances in most big clubs or the popular places that I've been to have been really low compared to what they were before. Now, maybe the numbers are still where they are, but in terms of vibe and kind of capacity when you're actually in these spaces, you can definitely tell there's a lot of empty spots here and there. And it's not surprising really with the pandemic going on and with a lot of our European brothers and sisters deciding to fly back home 
right and go visit family or basically move back home in general to for help family and help anybody else close to them or maybe people that maybe had previously lived in London deciding, hey, maybe this rat race of, you know, living or working for £800 and spending 600 of it on rent isn't really worth it. There's loads of things going on, right? Loads of moving pieces, loads of different stuff that's kind of affecting people's decisions uh, about what they would do, want to do going out. But I think in general, what I've said before on the podcast is that I think nightlife and I think hospitality and I think business in general they really took adv- i want to do it for advice but they really took i think businesses when it comes to stores especially central london i think they took for granted how much they relied on tourism especially the europe our european customers our european brothers and sisters and maybe some people from north america but i think the clubbing space for sure took for granted a lot of the um expats that we have living here newly you know arrived immigrants people just passing through especially people from Italy from Italy from France from Spain um, places that everyone kind of mocked and took the piss out especially when it comes to Italians right there's always a bad reputation with them when it comes to clubbing and whatnot but I think those guys and girls were I think the glue to the scene and they basically were the ones that filled out a lot of places and allowed people to basically earn a living in those um, industries and once they left it felt like the clubbing space has never really recovered and on top of that like i said the normies the kind of average everyday people that might have gone out to a club just because on a whim they've also been turned off so is what on one side is good because what you have left on the dance floor are hardcore club people for the most part if you're going to a club now you're definitely going to it because you want to go you're not going just because oh i'm in the area no you're going because you want to get loose and if you go regularly you're definitely going because you want to get loose regularly or lullily i have how you pronounce that fucking word <laughs> um, but it's no surprise of course now with nye to see ticket sales um slumping because of obviously the omicron variant and all these different changes that might take place with these new restrictions it's made people you know apprehensive and whatnot and if you can get rid of a bit of stress in your life that doesn't have to involve christmas new year's eve is the easiest thing to kind of sacrifice because i think most people again maybe it's to do with me i think maybe when i was younger new year's eve meant a lot more because i guess maybe it's partly to do with like not maybe being able to go outside so if you can't go out and then suddenly someone tells you hey there's this day that basically everyone's allowed out right it's the kind of it's the one free shot you get to kind of let loose maybe like people's birthdays of all might be here if you kind of grew up in a strict household but if you grow up in a strict household where you can't go out that much and you've got new year's eve it's an excuse to go outside so i definitely understood why some people would get excited by it. and again it probably explains why i was so hyped about it when i was younger but the older you get and the more disposable income you have the more ability you have to basically go out when you want how you want waiting for a specific day to really go ham doesn't really make that much sense you know what i mean so i definitely understand where it kind of changed in that regard so um this headline from mix mag is no surprise but let's quickly read the article it says ticket sales are starting to see a dramatic decline as COVID restrictions uncertainty sweeps through the uk and cases of omicron variant of the virus continue to skyrocket events discovery platform skiddle reported that ticket sales are now down 26 percent week on week and just this week alone a huge dip so sorry, just this week alone so a huge dip in sales for new year's eve events the quote here from a guy called jamie scahill who's a marketing director of skiddle he said i think it's to do with the uncertainty around the restrictions over the last two years everyone's been buying tickets to shows have been expected has been unexpectedly cancelled i think people are just holding off until they know exactly what's going on yeah i had one cancelled the other day i was meant to go see jazz play at the glove that fits and i just went on the ra and just said the event was cancelled there was no sorry postponed there was no update from the club no anything just postponed so i guess a lot of places are doing the same thing because they're trying to you know figure out what to do next it continues here jamie also told mix mag that it's been all right for the last couple of weeks but uncertainty has just crept in people don't want to go out and get infected before christmas of course again if you could choose between going out on christmas or going out on new year's day and you had only one to choose you'd obviously go for going out on christmas or sorry go to see a family christmas as a holiday you choose <clears throat> Another quote here said, obviously New Year's Eve is huge for us, so we'll see how that pans out over the next few weeks. Not really a lot of weeks to go, really, and it's only a couple. It says, yeah, although it's hard to tell whether this dip in sales is more directly to do with the rising cases or the ongoing uncertainty with the potential lockdown, The Guardian found just last week that there has been a huge number of no-shows ticket events, with some only reaching 60% ticket sales capacity. Yeah, and I think 
that's happening a lot in restaurant industry which i don't think is good i think that's always bad news i think that's always bad form if you book a table especially for more than two people and you decide to just not turn up and you don't call i don't think that's fair especially for the most part restaurants especially nowadays if they are going to accommodate a group of 10 20 people they would most likely going to you know pull in some extra staff get some extra bodies in the kitchen get some extra bodies you know on the main floor um in order to kind of make sure everyone that's basically meant to come is you know served on hand or waited on hand and foot and all their needs are met so when you don't turn up it effectively hurts them in the pocket it kind of obviously sullies the mood i guess in the restaurant too when people are just not showing up for their bookings or not calling ahead of time it's just not cool i don't think so if people are putting an option up there for you to book because i think as well booking should just only be reserved to certain restaurants i think most restaurants should basically implore people to just turn up on the day and if you got your seat got your seat i know it's going to limit the amount of people that you can basically cater to but i think in general people take advantage of, of the booking system especially for a place where they know they can guarantee a seat but they don't have to basically rush to get it and if something changes they don't want to go and call them because you know whatever i don't think that's cool it continues here says Sasha Lord Park Life and Warehouse Project head Honcho told The Guardian that the knock on effects of this are phenomenal while four of the 10 ticket holders aren't turning up to live shows. It says the analytics company Purple 7 recently launched an in-depth analysis into the rise and fall of tickets in 2021 and argued that despite the dramatic increases in the second half of the year celebration could be premature as sales begin to plummet of course and I've noticed that being outside when you're actually when you're actually there in the midst of things you notice it it's obvious to see there's so many holes in the crowd like again from the tourists from you know from places like italy spain germany france places in the nordics and then you go obviously to the north americans who might come over here and there some south americans are come visit the southeast asia there's a lot of tourism that we're missing out and then on top of that the normies again normies i'm relating to the kind of people that go out for drinks after work and shoot in liverpool shoreditch and what liverpool shoot in shoreditch and then maybe if they're out longer or after the hours of 11 and 12 and it's on the weekend they might feel cheeky enough to go to egg might feel cheeky enough to go to i don't know another club that's in that area but now that the clubs or now that those people aren't around anymore those same clubs are struggling to fill because the ones that are going there are only the club kids and the club kids don't go out every weekend you know what i mean they go out hard on some weekend but they don't go out every weekend whereas those normies it's not the same normie person but the same kind of avatar of that person basically comes every other weekend because they go out every week for drinks after work so you've always got a kind of weird regular customer or somebody that's not regular do you know what i mean it's like it's not the same person but it's the same type of person so they're missing on that so that's a huge big deal um despite the worrying dip in sales it says here towards the end jamie tells us that live music has thrived in 2021 of course you'll say that mate you're the marketing manager of skittle i'm uh, looking forward to another great 2022 he says we've had an amazing year generally the business in 21 years yeah i bet it is mate i bet it is yeah go you gotta know what your bread's bud in it so i don't blame the guy for for talking all that jazz when it comes to the ticket sales in london or ticket sales in general because you know i still think it's going to be a bit of a mad one going forward but you know what do i know in that regard what do i know let's get forward a little bit let's talk about some streetwear news this is courtesy of supreme obviously one of my favorite brands of all time have announced that they've got a collaboration um launching soon with dickies um, I think I've done a few of these collaborations previously, but this might be one of my favorites, of course, because it's got camo. And most of you guys will know I'm addicted to camo. I've got many, many camo items in my wardrobe right this minute. I'm the kind of guy that owns like probably about 10 plus M65s. If you don't know what they are, Google them, see what they look like. And then imagine me having 10 plus of those in different types of camo. It doesn't make any sense it's a ridiculous thing to have but i just can't let go of any of them i think each of them have a different sort of style that i like to wear it's just it's just nonsense anyway but regardless let's move back onto the topic of the uh, hand it says here supreme and dickies it says in 1992 dickies founded a partner da, da, da. let's not read all that so all that fly this is here Supreme has worked with Dickies on a new collection for fall 2021. The collection consists of a quilted denim jacket, overalls, and sorry, coveralls and pants. So, a really, it seems like slim. I wonder if this is a purposeful thing they're doing at the moment when they do collaboration, especially when they do sort of kind of um collaborations with brands where they do is it what would you call it a capsule collection. It seems like they opt for a smaller amount of pieces either very small concentrated amount of pieces or they go 
crazy and they do more than 10 or more than 12. It doesn't feel like they do anything in between. It's either really small, you get some jackets, some hats, a couple pieces of outerwear, and then or you go really ham and it's like t-shirts, long sleeves, jumpers, hats, key rings, all that malarkey. But I really like all of this, man. This, that jacket looks hard. All of it looks hard. You can't go wrong with any of it, really, to be honest. And again, this is, again, another reminder when it comes to Supreme and doing these collaborations and just the way they do them. Like, whenever you doubt them, whenever you think they've kind of lost their source and they're not where they should be, they always do this. They always hit you up the side of your head. And this, again, an easy win when it comes to collaborations, when it comes to branding. You know, everyone knows Dickies. Everyone's familiar with the brand. They know their history. Obviously, the connections Dickies have with skateboarding is, you know, doesn't even need to be spoken about. And, you know, they then have the opportunity also when they work with Dickies or work with these brands to reintroduce um, pieces from the brand's archive that maybe some people have maybe overlooked. I think of the Denali from Supreme that they did, obviously, with No Face. I don't think that was something that was on hot on most people, especially in streetwear and hype side of streetwear's lips. I think if you're from the kind of Japanese sort of outwear scene, you would have known how awesome a Denali is in terms of a layering piece, just as a piece of wear when you kind of got your Nike or Ividoshis on or whatnot. But for other kids, they probably didn't know that existed. So the fact that Supreme were able to make that jacket and make it look cool, I think even to this day, those Denali still sell for crazy amounts on StockX, considering how I'm quote unquote unpopular at the time. But because it's such a rare kind of one away thing, people obviously kind of lap it up. But I think these co these coveralls are fucking sick, to be honest. That with the quilted sort of pattern on it as well, and the distressness on it as well is awesome. I love it all, man. The pink is really nice too, the pink. And again, the color choices are always really well done. Denim, you got camo, gray, black and gray camo, you got the pink, and then you got the black as well. Probably the black is maybe the weakest color out of all of them, which is ironic too, and you wouldn't think that you'd think the black would maybe be the safest, but I think the black is maybe the, the black is maybe the nafis. Like if you're gonna get this sort of collaboration, you definitely have to pick from one of these, the free layer, or the maybe the free sort of out there colorways. I think the out there colors are probably still the pink and the camo. I think the light blue denim is kind of a standard look. I think that will look good on most people, but for sure, you can't go black. You definitely have to go for another sort of option. And I don't mean go black that way, so relax. Oh, come on, it's not gonna work now because I think the computer's maybe crashed because I'm doing too much Supreme. To, I'm doing some, too much Supreme jacking off so the computer decided to crash on me. Does that look like it? Yeah, it looks like the arrows aren't moving, unfortunately. Oh, this is annoying, isn't it? But so far, what have you got? You've got the coveralls I've seen. I think we've seen the, we've not seen the jacket yet, have we? No, let's see what the work jacket looks like. I think it's going to be a standard work jacket, which they already, that's a thing with Supreme 2. They already jacked the template for the work jacket because they have a their own inline one that they use now at the moment. So I'm sure they probably had to, you know, exchange some funny LOLs and emails over the back of this because I'm pretty sure the work wear jacket Supreme make is exactly the same shape. Um, it's probably, again, based on the original Dickies work wear jacket that they probably made back in the day. But I think it looks fucking great regardless. And of course, if you get the camo version of that coverall you definitely, definitely have to get a pink jacket if you get the camo version yeah the camo version you get a pink jacket then in version you definitely get camo jacket and then pink overalls you probably get i think denim light blue will probably work right with the pink overalls if you're gonna get a jacket on top i'd, I'd assume but yeah it looks pretty nice very heavy very quilted very warm um, and yeah, an easy piece to kind of add to your wardrobe and just freshen things up a bit from all the usual drudgery that you kind of get from Supreme and some of the stuff they put out nowadays. But yeah, I like that. I don't mind that whatsoever. I'm not going to lie. I don't mind that. Is it off the screen now? Or is it not? I don't think it is. Is it? Oh, damn it. Annoying. The thing's not working anymore. Anyway, let's move on. Um, let's move on to this one. Let's go talk. Oh, yes, talk about this. This is courtesy of Hype Beast. Courtesy of Hype Beast, and we've got some interesting news here. Interesting news indeed. Courtesy of Hype Beast it says Frank Ocean's Homer announces new collection and launches a global e commerce shop. So, if you're wondering why Frank Ocean keeps postponing, you know, festival appearances, mostly, you know, he's using the excuse of COVID and whatnot and hiding behind that. But for the most part, he pops out to the other awards ceremony, mostly the Met Gala and nothing more of that ilk, maybe 
Grammys has he been there I'm not too sure I don't think he has but you don't really see much of Frank Ocean's a part of Frank Ocean's a Frank Ocean apart from you know weird um zoomed out the pictures of him cycling somewhere in New York which is a bit strange too because I think everyone's known for ages that he lives in New York right um it's not really a big deal I think his store if I'm not mistaken was going to open up in New York the kind of jewelry store that he's got going on there for his brand Homer so it doesn't really make sense why people get so excited to see him in New York right cycling around like what else is he meant to do but he obviously lives a pretty nomadic life in that respect. He doesn't really go out that much. It feels like, um, or he doesn't really, he's not really mingling in the industry circles that you'd think he would be. Obviously, I don't think he would be that. Hmm, not think he would be, but you know what I mean. And the music obviously is pretty much non-existent in terms of new new singles and new bodies of work. And I was wondering this off the back of a clip that I saw of Ari Lennox talking about how she basically is considering maybe hanging it up when it comes to being a musical, a professional musical artist. She might put out one last album and decide to pivot into other things because the it, the music business side of it's quite depressing, right? How kind of hard it is to navigate and how much it sucks out of you as a person and whatnot. And I completely understand that. But it also made me think about this idea. It also made me think about something that I thought about a lot when it comes to really highly creative people who maybe just have a lot of ideas who maybe get typecasted or maybe get put into one box when they're coming up because they just happen to be really good at this one thing earlier on, but they want to do these other things. But then what ends up happening is that I feel like music and a lot of things, maybe like even like sport, maybe even just being an influencer, I think they're great occupations because what they allow you to do is they allow you to get your foot in the door. They allow you to showcase your talent in one side of things and then if you're smart and you're diligent and you've got the right people around you, you can leverage that one bit of fame for other bits of fame, right? Or you can, well, so you can leverage that one bit of fame to open different doors that you probably wouldn't be able to open on your own. So I'll think of it with Frank Ocean's side of things. Maybe he's just one of those guys who it's not his fault. He just happens to be really amazing at singing. It's not his fault. He just happens to be an absolute wizard when it comes to songwriting, when it comes to making up of melodies and whatnot. But what he always wanted to do maybe was to be a somewhat, you know, what would you call it? Um, a renaissance man, right? He wanted to own, again, his own jewelry company. He wanted to have a small boutique somewhere in, you know, all the kind of popping cities around the world. Maybe that's what he's always wanting to do. He wanted maybe to get into musical production because you think of some of these stage designs that he's done throughout his time performing or short time performing in live shows. They've always been really interesting. His approach to how he releases music in terms of the magazines he does, the vinyls, the prints, how the vin how the magazines were even sold, right? In terms of these weird pop ups popping up in random places, especially here in London. Um, the way the music comes out on streaming platforms, the finesse he did to his previous label with Blunded. Like there's all these little things that he does that maybe makes you think maybe he never really wanted to be a pop not pop star but like a proper musical artist in that way he just wanted to do what he's doing now where he has the ability to drop an album or drop some music whenever he feels like it he also has the ability to launch a global e-commerce platform and maybe open a store design cool bits of jewelry show off his body and his cool furniture on instagram that's maybe what he's always wanted to do um, and it just happened to be that he's really good at music. Do you know what I mean? It's a complete opposite of what I was talking about on the podcast when it concerns Sweetie. I was like, oh, it must be weird. It must be a hard position to be in when you look like Sweetie and when you're like, you know, you're born incredibly attractive and cute and pretty and whatnot, but you just don't have the chops that it needs you need in order to be a performing artist, to be an artist or a singer or whatnot. She just doesn't have it, right? Doesn't seem like the most coordinated person in the world, can't sing for shit, rapping is non existent. But you're just so gorgeous or so good to look at, people just want to keep looking at you and a good thing to use if people want to keep looking at you is obviously to get on Instagram and become one of those people or to just start doing music because you're gonna be on video, you're gonna be rapping stuff, you're gonna be saying things like you're always gonna be in front of some sort of camera. So that's a good way to kind of expose yourself that way. But if you don't have the talent for it what's the point it's going to be a bit of a fool's errand and i think maybe the the opposite could be said again the inverse could be said for frank ocean in that regard too just because he's good at music should he just keep doing it to satisfy his fans to satisfy himself to satisfy his label or whatever who's kind of whatever is that a thing you should be doing or if you have the option to do other things that actually bring you joy especially in this short time we have on this earth maybe you should go and pursue those things maybe 
but anyway this is the title um some images obviously showing you the magazine itself obviously like you know when it comes to print and putting these kind of things together frank ocean is always really good in that regard i wonder if he has received any help when it comes to putting these things together with this the stuff that he thinks up in his mind but i love that he's really into magazines i love that he's really into print um the jewelry pieces he designs for homer look really really interesting stuff that you obviously won't find in different in other places in terms of how he designs jewelry and a sort of um things that he uses i love the fact that these little ornaments um i think uh, i don't know what they're ornaments or whatnot but they kind of look like um lsd tabs and whatnot or acid tabs so that's pretty cool to see and just really cleverly done the scarves of course they're included as well how much are the silk scarves the silk scarf it doesn't say right it's a price and request i'm assuming or does it say there but i can't see i don't know but yeah wheezy scarf dolly scarf dolly scarf excel wheezy scarf excel they all look really really cool man everything here looks really well presented really well put together um i, I think did i see somebody on youtube that purchased a homer piece i think it might be one of those um korean or japanese sort of like um fashion vlogger guys that are really cool that go around shopping for really expensive cool things that they kind of show off online that whole subculture is always great i love it because it reminds me of the days when i used to post on this forum called fifth dimension back in the day that was kind of a little bit like that it had a lot of people that kind of lived in southeast asia a lot of people who at the time i didn't know because i was flipping 18 years old by the time these guys were like in their mid-20s early 30s so they were making what i was basically make nowadays right in terms of a salary and they were able to buy all this stuff by the time i was like how, how are you affording visit him how are you doing this but basically they're just normal jobs um but it was cool to basically see them buying neighborhood double taps vis vim goros like it was just a crazy crazy time so those vloggers on youtube are definitely people that kind of remind me or make me reminisce about those old guys but again they're far nicer in it because those older guys on fifth dimension were fucking cunts um but yeah look at these bracelets they all look so so good man designs are amazing i bet they must look so much better in person as well i'm sure he's using you know uh, specific gems that's something i'd actually like to get into actually jewelry just in terms of, of a, even if it's not buying loads of amazing things myself but just as a fan in terms of understanding stones clarity weights cuts and all that stuff that's be a really good thing to dive into because i'm already thinking going forward that i want to start getting serious about relearning how to skate again because i used to skate when i was younger i think i started when i was what 13 12 skating until about 19 consistently and then kind of dropped off and haven't done it since but i would like to relearn to skate again and just kind of use that as an opportunity to kind of get geeky and get kind of really interested in something to a hardcore level so that i'm not fucking spending time you know perusing the news and reading about fucking covid and whatnot and learning about people's divorces who i don't know it just doesn't need that information in my head so i'm thinking of doing that buying a cruiser board and just basically learning how to skate watching loads of videos of guns and whatnot and just kind of getting deep into that world again because that gave me a lot of I won't say purpose, but it gave me a lot of time to basically do stuff, right? To be outdoors, to be busy, meet new people, um, learn, fall over, all that shit. It's really cool. I, I'm, I'm really down for it. And again, maybe joy is another thing as well I can do too off the side of that as well. But this all looks so, so impressive. So, so cool. And again, like he definitely has puts a lot more effort it feels like into this sort of stuff that he's doing with the jewelry than he's ever shown us with his music i feel like especially nowadays maybe frank ocean first coming into the scene different because again he was trying to get off his label clearly but the kind of care attention to detail the consistency in messaging and the consistency of just putting out stuff in general um, definitely leads me to believe that this is something he's always definitely wanting to do um more so than maybe doing stuff like you know making music which he just happens to be really talented at again that must be a weird place to be in you happen to be really good at this one thing but you don't also enjoy doing this one thing on a daily basis but anyway quick little article here from hypebeat said frank Ocean's luxury brand homer has officially launched his e-commerce making its products available worldwide so it's a luxury brand so when you have a jewelry brand you just call it a luxury brand you don't call it a jewelry brand i guess because you want to allow yourself the ability to do other things but if you're a jewelry brand, you're a jewelry brand. Why call yourself a luxury brand? Anyway, continue. The playful collection is inspired by a symbol of a dog featured with various pendants, bracelets, and rings assembled in nano ceramic colored sterling silver, 18 karat gold, and diamonds exclusively produced in America. Wow. 
all made in the US of A. Um, Ocean shares a conscription of the collection saying when a dog comes to stay, explores a dog as a symbol of one that walks lighter. A sheepdog, an Akita and a bull terrier are rendered in pixels as to simplify the qualities that makes them our family. To the dog, it seems low teeth without thinking. Love it. Like all of Homer's products, they're designed in New York City, handmade in Italy and diamonds are all come from a state of the art lab in the US. Okay, it's great to hear. Um, Homer is officially available to ship globally at homer.com. Those who want to visit the store can check out the store in Brewer Street. Oh, sorry, on Bowery. Okay, wow. So, okay, nice. Take a scroll above to see the catalog and where it's coming from. Of course, that's him sitting on a Dieter Rams chair as well, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, big up Frank, looking ripped as well as ever. Looking cute, sitting down on his thing. But yeah, it makes me wonder, man. I wonder if this is what he's always wanting to do. This is that's just actually been his passion, not making music. He just happens to be really good at making music. And it comes really easy to him. But this is actually what actually gets him up in the morning. Um, gives him a purpose, gives him a direction, um, fills him with inspiration. And basically is a way to him to as well to kind of flex his interests, right? Design, um, and all manner of other things that basically inform the stuff that he basically puts on these penders and how they put together but they just look so cool don't they really really cool so big up mr ocean big up mr ocean for sure move off of that one we did that we did that <laughs> Oh, it's another one. Let's talk about these quickly because wow, 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 wow. This is courtesy of Jound. They don't miss with their collaborations, right? They really, really don't miss. I think most people would agree with that, but let's just look at these. So this is courtesy of Jound um, on their Instagram page. And they decided to kind of mini break my side of the internet by announcing that they're doing a collaboration with Bape on a pair of Bapesters that I feel like these shoes have kind of come back into the kind of cultural zeitgeist out of nowhere i don't know what happened maybe it's the resurgence of the sort of new y2k trend going on at the moment this sort of like early 2000s you know kind of trend that kids are doing now where they're wearing ed hardy they're hearkening back to all those times i see people sharing cool little images of pharrell back in the day when he was in nerd little wayne when he used to wear bait it feels like that kind of whole look is coming back maybe it's to do with the chunky or the sorry the baggy trousers and the dunks but it's definitely an aesthetic that i think people are leaning into a lot more you sort of see justin bieber doing it in a really big way but it feels like babesters are kind of again having a second third fourth sixth seventh life and it's a bit weird because it feels like the current iteration of Bape is nothing close to what I grew up with. The Bape that I'm still in love with, the Bape that I still buy archive pieces from all the time now. Not from, you know, I'm not going to tell you where because I don't want everyone to bait up, but I still buy basically a jacket or a hat or a t shirt every single month when I get paid just to kind of add to my collection. I've got many, many magazines of, you know, old interviews with Nigo and, you know, line sheets and kind of look books like actual physical books that i still kind of look at and kind of dream about from time to time i still kind of kick myself that i sold that massive um gore-tex downfield um bathing ape snowball jacket like i don't believe why i let that go it's such a dumb move really really amazing jacket i ended up letting go back in the day um but yeah paper is definitely one of my favorite brands definitely a brand that could basically introduce me to streetwear introduce me to the kind of japanese side of things as well when it comes to that whole urahara um culture and whatnot so to see jown basically adopting their sort of minimalistic simplistic sort of um design codes um or house codes you'd say to a bape nowadays is quite interesting because what they sort of represent when it comes to design especially when it comes to footwear collaborations is completely i won't say antithetical but it's kind of the opposite of what bape sort of were about right it was all gaudy it was really loud it was in your face it kind of you know harkened back to again take inspiration from you know old hip-hop videos and um advertising americana bold beautiful again there was that marvel collection that one was one of the best where they all came like packaged like an actual action figure like crazy work went into them right i couldn't imagine how much it cost to produce them no wonder Diego ran out of money and had to sell it um but now it's kind of a dead brand because Nigo doesn't own it i think that chinese company called it owns it or whatnot so the actual mainline collection of its stuff is really hit and miss it's terrible i think there was a small period of time when Nigo left where it felt like his interns or the people that founded the company with him were still there for a couple of years if you remember i don't know the dates exactly but if you try and look at some of the 
lookbooks or collections just after Nigo left, they were pretty they were pretty good still. Then I think whenever those guys' contracts ran out or they left because they got absorbed by another company, they probably didn't like working for them. Suddenly it dropped off a cliff, and that's when you saw them do collaborations with like Puma and shit. That's when you saw like weird rappers wearing it. It just it just went to complete dog doo doo. So I feel like these shoes represent maybe a sign of good things to come. Hopefully, because it wouldn't surprise me if they told me oh. Justin Saunders of Jound is now the creative director of Baby Ape or something, or one of those kind of guys. That wouldn't surprise me. That would be definitely something I could see happening in the near future because it feels like that brand is kind of um, a little bit of an untapped resource. It kind of reminds me of how Stussy was back in the day when Stussy kind of messed up their distribution. Um, they weren't really, they didn't have the, the affairs in order when it comes business wise. The branding was all over the place. And then suddenly out of nowhere, they kind of decided to go back to basics. And now they're essentially, I feel like, carrying the entire streetwear industry on their back when it comes to quintessential streetwear stuff right when it comes to hats t-shirts hoodies long sleeves and all that shit they're producing stuff on such a level on such a consistent basis as well it's just scary so i wouldn't surprise me if this maybe is a sign of things to come maybe jaron takes over at babe maybe somebody else from that crew but i can definitely see these babes as being another kind of again another sign that things can change maybe in the future maybe it's going to come back in a big big way but the shoes themselves are great i love the simplicity of the colorways i think jaron again they don't miss when it comes to shoe collaborations they do them really well they do them really subtly um they're done in a way where they don't do too much without doing too little as well i feel like um as much as i'm a big fan of all the maximalist shoes out there and the crazy crazy gaudy colorways i still think it's something to be said for having the ability to strip get it down to basics and still make something that's, that's desirable without using all the loud colors it's hard to do it really is hard to do i guarantee it's not easy to do this to kind of get a shoe um strip it down to its pure essence and then still try and make it desirable is hard but the fact that they did it on a shoe that's mostly white with a gray swoosh kind of going back to the classic sort of nike air force one high sort of colorway that i had from back in the day too that's kind of the colorway you'd assume it'd be especially if it's got like an off white or sail laces and whatnot that's basically how that color was so it's basically back to basic stripped down and base stripped down to its essence and i'm interested to see if they're actually going to have other colors in the collection or if it's just going to be that shoe but um, or if it's going to be a capture collection too it might be other bits and pieces it might be clothing uh, it might be accessories but it'll be cool to see what they do and hopefully they go back to the archive and they just um what they do and they just kind of l take loads of key amazing things from the archive that they've made and then maybe reissue them and put their own spin on them that'll be cool so maybe we'll get a John version of a snowboard jacket a John version of a bomber a John version of an m65 a John version of maybe one of those trucker hats they used to do back in the day like just many many different things i think will definitely go well um with that kind of audience and maybe not again i think that's interesting isn't it thinking about that actually now like would the jound customer base be into if they be into it if they made like a capsule collection of bait products would they that be something would they be down for that probably not right you would imagine because they like a particular aesthetic and aesthetic is like you know it's very tumblr it's very you know, it's very back in the day blog spot right it's kind of very minimal it's very bare it's all about tones and hues and fabrication and textures it's less about again colors like pure pantone shit it's more about the hue so maybe that will be a way where they kind of diverge a little bit but i'm interested to see what happens i really am and to see how this kind of goes down with everyone going forward but again no dates no kind of idea i did see someone in the comments say something like oh they had rumored that there was talk that supposedly this was going to cost like 300 euros or 300 pounds or something which might make sense because i've been zoomed in a little bit on it it looks like it's completely tumbled lever upper as well and maybe i don't know if they got them that's a metal ring at the top maybe they've got like jones embossed there but it doesn't look like there's many jound in iconography pieces i can see there maybe at the back of the hill but babes are still written on there on the toe and it looks like it's all tumbled level with these tubular laces which is a bit shit i don't like the tubular laces but yeah i've heard something like 300 supposedly i'm not sure if that's true or not but if that is oof, get your bank cards out you know ask your mom for a bit of money because this is going to be a tough tough time but you know let's see what happens let's see if they do release to a wider public and we are able to kind of get them I imagine probably not, but you know, stranger things have happened, isn't it? Stranger things have happened. Um, what else we got to talk about here? 
פש פש פוש. Where is it? Oh, you. Yeah, there we go. Let's talk about this quickly. Um, this is Kurtzsch again of Hypebeast. Um, interesting direction that Bottega Veneta are going in now since they've obviously dumped my guy Daniel Lee and they've kind of decided to go in a completely different direction by hiring somebody that worked underneath him, <laughs> Matthew Blasey. But from what I've read online and people in the know, people seem to be really excited by this appointment, this new creative director of Bottega Veneta. I think people are basically saying that he was maybe the one that was actually responsible for most of the magic that we saw and the pieces that basically stood out a lot if i'm not mistaken when i checked his instagram last time he had that kind of suit pattern that kind of jacket print that skepta wore the outfit remember that kind of um, amazing print supposedly he designed that and a few other pieces so maybe he was the actual um brains behind some of the pieces that we all know and love but people were still rated him also because of his previous work that he did at Margiela. I think he was responsible for making some of these masks covered in rhinestones that Kanye wore was he was performing sometime. So he's clearly got chops, he's clearly got reputation, he's clearly got talent, clearly got the ability to obviously take that role forward. But I was interested to see how they would pivot in terms of their messaging and branding because I did feel like some other people felt specifically Brian Boy, but I, I, I kind of felt the same prior to maybe announcing on social. I didn't basically write it down and timestamp and shit which i probably should do a lot more but i did feel like there was too much emphasis i felt like too much pandering done to catering to people that look like myself right black people and it was just ironic too because then you know that story came out about allegedly that daniel lee said what he said in that meeting but i did feel like it was a little bit one notey like i felt like he was trying too hard to be in with the cool kids i think after that presentation they did in berkheim they had an after party at the shortage house there in berlin um had virgil djing had burner boy turn up it was just a bit you know it was performing just a little bit cringe so i could definitely see why they would want to pivot away but i wonder how they were going to do it was it going to be a hard left was it going to be a subtle thing because i feel like nowadays you don't really need to do that cold pandering to one subset of people or a race of people whatever you don't need to do it because i feel like nowadays it's undeniable how cool it is to have an advertising or a lookbook or a marketing campaign be that kind of reflects what your customer base is or what the world is nowadays right multicultural you know no real borders and stuff people from all different walks of life blah 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 blah, blah. and again it's just closed at the end of the day right if you're not trying to be heady slim you don't really have a really defined kind of idea of what the kind of male body ideal male body should look like you should really try and play around with it and try and see where that takes your brand or maybe whatever other way around so um that chasing again that kind of chasing after the kids that have really dark skin or look really crazy or have weird ears it's just an annoying and unnecessary and if anything it comes across a bit disingenuous like you don't really love us you're just doing it because we look good on paper we look good blown up on a poster we look good walking down your runway maybe it's cool to have us kind of you know saying something in a on video like no i'm not really for it so it's interesting to see this courtesy of hype it says bottega veneta partners with italian artisan for Bottega for Bottega's project so clearly they decided to dump all of that rapidly rap rap shit from before um, and basically pivot the branding or the messaging away from just representing one subgroup of people and representing it feels like everybody really as opposed to I mean before that so before it felt like more of a, a brand for the cool kids made by the cool kids now it feels like it's a brand for everybody everyone to take part everyone to enjoy it feels like anyway so let's go to the article. It says, Bottega Veneta has announced um, a new holiday initiative partnering with 12 um, Bottegas and artisans for the Bottega for Bottegas project. The new campaign is an act of solidarity with these makers, allowing Bottega Veneta to use its global reach to shine a light on the work of the Bottegas from across Italy. So it's being selfless. It's putting themselves behind the scenes when really they are in front because their name's plastered all over it. And it's using it as an opportunity to kind of promote local businesses and shit which is good to see um the toilet potatoes come from all over the country and specialize in products ranging from creamery rossi biscuits um pastifico martinelli also in past sorry pastifico martelli pasta to orsoni ceramics and armatruda paper the project includes an offline campaign 
with products um, from the Bottegas on display at Bottega Veneta's the store in Italy and advertising campaign across Milan in online presence. So they've got the things in store and they're doing the most of this. It's really cool. The online element of the initiative includes newsletters, advertising and space on the house website. While the products will not be available in the Bottega Veneta store, the customers will be directed to the shop directly at the Bottegas in question. That's a bit dumb. They should have probably brought more in house, in it? Or at least had a pop-up that they could basically allow people to buy those things too and support. But, you know, at least they're pointing in the right direction. That's pretty cool still um of course there's a video there i'm not playing that because i'm going to copyright con content but yeah see they are highlighting all of these um other bottegas that happen to be in the vicinity or, or based in italy which is great to see and again it's definitely a complete change from how they were positioning themselves prior under daniel lee's kind of tutelage you know he kind of was all about the people, all about the individual, all about the celebrity, um, all about the blacks. And and, and uh, Matthew Blasi has come in and just been like, you know what? I'm all about the product. I'm all about the community. I'm all about the people. I'm all about the whites. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. You know what I mean? Though. Um, but yeah, let's see, man. Let's see how that does. Again, I'm just curious to see what the clothes look like on a runway. I think this stuff is all cute and good and shit, but you know, Bottega tried to already distract us with all that kind of online journal, which is just a blog thing, not a blog like nonsense, no social media shit. Again, that's interesting too. What are they going to do with social media? Will they relaunch it when Matthew Blasey presents his first collection or will they just keep it offline like they did before? I think they should announce it and put it forward, I think, going forward. It sh they should do. I think so. Because I bet you Celine kicking themselves that they didn't really lean into e-commerce and social media when Phoebe Fowler was around. They would have been absolutely, they would have been still been selling pieces to this day if they wanted to off the back of that. But, you know, Phoebe Fowler had such a grip on that brand that when she said no e-commerce, no social media or not heavy like that, they basically bucked to her because, you know, she was keeping the house lights on. But I think going forward, if you've got rid of one guy who was a bit tyrannical, maybe with this one, just tell him, look, you have to plug and play when you're at Protego. You can't just do what you want. And maybe just have that um, social media presence up there already because, like it or not, that is the new world we're living in, isn't it? That is a new world. Uh, the video, should I play it? Is it going to be copyrighted material? Fuck yeah, let's play it. Who gives a shit? I'm not fucking Joe Rogan, am I? Let's play the damn video. It's only 55 seconds as well, so let's see what it's saying. <laughs> There's a world, there's, a, there's one word that represents it. Oh wow, look at that. Amazing. Bottega stepped out the spotlight to give other Bottegas the stage. That's cool, isn't it? They're replacing all the items in the store with all these local products that you can't get in the shop anymore. Imagine walking into Bottega Veneta right and wanting to get your nigger puddle boots, right? And then you walk in and you see where your puddle boots would have been or some fucking, it's a bag of pasta or some shit. You probably might scream out nigger as well, innit? Like, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like it, man. I like it. I'm, again, interested to see what direction they go in, clothing-wise, how they're going to pivot, how they're going to make it make sense. Will the fans still be into it? Because it feels like, as great as Bottega Veneta was, it felt like a lot of the people that were standing over it were mostly standing over it because of Daniel Lee. They were mostly Daniel Lee acolytes as opposed to Bottega Veneta acolytes. So what are they going to do that way? Also with him, will he come back and launch his own brand? Will he address all the allegations? Who knows? Um, but yeah, I'm curious to see what Matthew Blasey does, man. I really, really am because I think this is a really cool way to um, reintroduce a brand or to basically um, remind, no, to, no, to basically reintroduce the brand with you at the helm. I think it's a great way to do it, um, especially considering how individualistic and how all about Daniel the you know Bottega was prior. So the, so the fact that this is now him kind of taking the back seat a little bit and letting the brand speak for itself and him just being the custodian for that time is an interesting approach i'm not going to lie very very interesting approach and let's see if that works out for them in it let's see if that works out for them um what else we need to talk about here 
pish pash posh, I did that, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. Oh, let's talk about this actually, lastly, right? Um, This is courtesy of WWD magazine, right? And I wanted to touch on this because I just think it's an interesting story in terms of um, the changing nature of fashion, the changing nature of just, you know, sensibilities, preferences, um, representation and all that. And it feels like a real battle between the new world and the old world. And this is courtesy of WWD magazine. It says the following, what's going on with Celine and Vogue? And the article says here, French luxury brand Celine and Vogue appear to not be on the best of fashion friends after Emmanuelle Alt left Vogue France, formerly known as Vogue Paris. Still, that name doesn't ring in it. It doesn't really fall off the tongue like Vogue Paris did in it. Vogue France, like what? Um, the brand's artistic, because you know they're not going to represent France, you know what I mean? They, you know they're not going to be going to far-flung places in France and actually talking to real people and getting their voices heard or displaying different types of French beauty that doesn't just kind of, you know, um, subscribe to the traditional sort of um, old-school cinematic view of what French beauty is, right? They're not going to do that. They're just going to be very specific and kind of catered to only the cool cities, um, the cool towns. Ugh, but uh, where, where, what do I know? The brand's artistic creative image director, Hedy Slimain, um, is understood to be upset, so upset by Alt's departure from Rogue Runway. Um, was So, yeah, so let's repeat that again, because I didn't even know this was actually even happening. It's fucking insane. This guy's still out here kind of beefing fucking publications. I remember back in the day when Hedy Slimane banned, what's her name, Kathy Horn from reporting onto his show, right? And she had to just basically, and she just kept moaning and bitching about it on her uh, flipping reviews that she had to view all the clothes via 2D images online. It's like, babe, welcome to our world. We have to view things on our fucking phone and zoom in on them and post them on Instagram and make ourselves look cool. Um, welcome to our world. As they continue, sorry. The brand artistic, creative, and image director. Look at the amount of roles he's got. I wonder if he gets paychecks for each of them or if it's just a forward slash, forward slash. Um, Heidi Samain is understood to be so upset by Oz's departure that Vogue Runway was not invited to cover Celine's Spring 2022 virtual show. It quotes here, it says, it was not our decision to not cover the Spring 2022 but we look forward to covering the brand's next show, said the Vogue source. So basically they weren't invited. That's kind of fashion speak for, he told us to fuck off, we told him to fuck off, and let's see if he changes his mind next time. Especially if it affects the sales, right? No one, no one ever comes out and says what they say. No one ever comes out and says what they think in fashion because they're trying to protect themselves in order to make sure that if a job comes up or if there's an opportunity to make some money with you, they can still do it. So yeah, it's a proper two-faced world. It continues, said WWE, WWD also understands from sources that Slimane has has expressed his frustration to Vogue Global Director and Condé Nast Chief Executive Content Officer Anna Winter and hit the brakes on some advertising with Vogue brand. So he's so upset he got on the blower. He texted Anna Winter and was like, "Look, I'm not standing for this. Why did you get rid of Emmanuela Alt and you know change it to fucking Vogue Paris and get rid of all these um, what what are they called uh, is it Sagli is it Alt and Saglio right the other woman it's Geraldine Saglio the other stylist that's meant to be really important over there mad isn't it." A spokesman, spokeswoman for Celine said that that was incorrect, but did not provide any further detail. Over the past year, amid a global pandemic, Condé Nast has made sweeping changes to its organization structure as it looks to streamline global editions to save cost. It began last December when execs announced that Winter would be given even more control by making her chief executive content officer, global editorial director of Vogue, while continuing to cover it, to oversee Vogue US. Do you remember when it, the social media tried to cancel Anna Winter because of all the stuff that was happening at um, fucking, what's that kitchen? Bon Appetit or something. Was it there, Bon Appetit? Imagine, you, you people actually thought you could cancel um, Anna Winter because of a couple of omelets or some shit. Like, are you insane? Like... They just she just doubled down and got even more jobs, even more power, and just said minor, like just relax, um, and just kept it moving. Basically, she didn't flinch at all. Nothing performative, nothing at all. She didn't post a black square. She just kept it moving. Um, at the same time, Edward Innerfall. The widely celebrated top director, sorry, top editor at British Vogue was promoted to European editorial director at Vogue for the markets owned and operated by Condé Nast, which include UK, France, Italy, Germany and Spain, which probably might explain why Hedy Samain is having such an issue with um, this new direction they're going in. Because if Edu Edward Innerfall is basically taking over um, the, con the the basically direction of that magazine, it's not going to look anything like what Emanuela Oates' Vogue Paris looked like or even what Karen Reutfeld's Vogue 
Paris looked like back in the day it's going to be completely different it continues here it says both moods explain you know one was very white <laughs> one was very Parisian and very Eurocentric and one's going to be very multicultural that's basically what I'm trying to say it continues it says both moves explained why there had been a mass exodus of European executives and editors in the weeks prior to the announcements including Vogue Germany and Spanish editors in chief um, Christine Arp and Eugene de la Trontini respectively man I remember that Christiane Arp she was everywhere on the street it's crazy how fast fashion moves in it these women were at the top of the food chain the, the, the Mount Everest of street style icons I always got the impression Emanuela Alt was kind of annoyed by the pictures that she kept getting taken of her but then she always kept getting dressed up she had that kind of ambivalence on her face a little bit of a kind of scorn right she kind of she kind of got that kind of appearance of somebody that maybe will look down on you right um, but you kind of like that it's kind of hot and the thing Christine App is the same sort of thing right she was really like she, I remember her wearing, I think, loads of dark denims, leather jackets and shit. Like, just really interesting that suddenly that whole street style of people wanting to look like editors and wanting their jobs and wanting to know what they drink for coffee, how they put magazines together, completely changed. And then people just started to want to be just standing around for standing around sake. That's when the whole fashion blogger thing blew up. And now we have people who are being celebrated for things that you would have never celebrated for in the past, right? Whether it's being fat, whether it's having some sort of disability, whether it's, um, I don't know, the pe people have been celebrated for things that would have ostracized them from fashion before. That's what I'm basically trying to say, um, which is a cool thing because I think it's reflective of the world overall, right? It's a lot more inclusive than it was prior. But it's also understandable why somebody like uh, Hedy Slimane, who kind of prides himself on being quite exclusionary, right? Just based on his clothes, right? You Like a Hedy Slimane designed flipping your trouser that's a 32 isn't going to be the same size 32 as a jean you're going to buy from fucking you know whatever other brand right he cuts trousers he cuts shirts and t-shirts and outwear in a way that caters only to his muse and his muse is usually really skinny wafy looking indie boys and it's only in recent years that he's kind of pivoted and started to include black kids in his group because that's the only thing that he was willing to compromise on but he still manages to and again i don't know how he does it he's casting a sensational i don't even think these guys even exist right but he still manages to f number one he can he finds really wafy looking young kids who look like they're in bands because they don't look like they don't look like tiktok kids because tiktok cute kids or cute boys for the most part again that's weird to say cute kids but you know what i mean the, the the kind of the hot boys on tiktok for the most part are quite buff they're into working out they're into doing press-ups some of them do steroids and shit right they're crazy about that about all that stuff there's a very americanized sense of beauty that way but hey this man obviously loves a british thing they're kind of um the peak doherty sort of style kind of looking guy right and you're not going to get that in America. But he somehow still manages to find that guy, that kid that still listens to bands and still goes to live shows and shit or plays an instrument. And he gets them in their shows. And he still, further than that, manages to find the unicorn of all unicorns, which is black kids in this current era who don't listen to rap or hip hop or all that stuff and st are still into bands and still going into live shows and whatnot and you know maybe uh put in flipping eyeliner on and whatnot all that stuff it's just insane what he finds but i don't know how he finds them but he does continued on quickly here says alt stayed on by may wwe reported that she was about to exit alongside olivier lalan of the french edition and gq and joseph I don't know how you know her surname. Yeah, da, da. She made the official announcement in September in an Instagram post stating, I'm deeply proud to announce that will be my very last issue of Vogue Paris since 100 years existence. With a special anniversary issue, it has been a huge privilege for me to be able to be, help create it. I couldn't have done it without the talent of a wonderful team and a brilliant readership to support our work. Al has been with Vogue for more than two decades and began her career working alongside her predecessor, Crane Royfield. She was named director in 2011, 2011 yeah, and they fell out as well. I would, I I'm, I'm curious to know if any fashion insiders got the goss I want to know why did they end up falling out carrying right for the Emanuela oh because they were an amazing flipping team and some of the some of those editorials that came out during that kind of time especially again with the much cancelled Terry Richardson around they were sensational man I've still got a lot of those magazines um, in my collection but I want to know why did Emanuela oh and Karen right for end up falling out um, Eugene Trochi was named as a successor by the title of head directorial content he now October that Vogue Paris will become Vogue France but yeah um, I don't know man I'm a little bit conflicted on this I kind of understand Heidi Semaine's 
annoyance of the direction fashion is going in because it does feel like there is no because nowadays there is no such thing as i won't say brilliance or there's there is a celebration of mediocrity there's also not this idea that fashion is kind of um what would you call it people are trying their best to make fashion especially runway stuff too similar to what you see in everyday streets right it's it's becoming like a mirror of the streets too much the kind of escapism that you used to see when you go to fashion shows doesn't exist as much and the kind of otherworldly nature of the alienly looking type of models that walk down the runway wasn't exist there because i think that some people don't really realize how weirdly freakish models look when you see them in real life like they're usually very long very lanky very slavere they have very kind of prominent facial features that you kind of spot and you know okay this is why this kid was a model because he's got really big ears really big eyes bushy eyebrows or something about their face it just kind of strikes you and for whatever reason they make the clothes look really cool when they walk down the runway now that doesn't mean that that was the only archetype that that person's designing for it doesn't mean that that's the only person that should wear those kind of clothes but there's no denying on that particular platform on that particular stage that's where it kind of shines the best i guess it's similar to like a movie just because you see really good actors kind of acting out a scene in a movie doesn't mean you can't then repeat that scene to a friend and it can still resonate but the best way to deliver it is to have these set actors doing this particular uh role or doing a particular scene in the end of it and i feel like nowadays that doesn't really exist so that kind of designer that has a very specific mu a specific person that they kind of designing for doesn't exist which is probably why people are so eager to have the likes of phoebe philo back because she spoke to a specific person and again if we follow one's an even interesting one right because she never from my experience had i can't remember many shows of phoebe follow maybe towards the end she maybe did it but there wasn't many shows where she was being inclusive where she had like plus size models on the runway but then all the accounts i've read of phoebe philo celine the people that bought it the most were older women who felt the most comfortable in it it made them feel chic it made them feel comfortable it made them feel hot without having to wear a mini dress and whatnot you know what i mean but the people that she put on the runway didn't necessarily reflect that but the people that bought it were obviously those people so she was obviously designing with them in mind but on the runway she felt like the best way to present it was to have these people wear those clothes and i just don't understand why that isn't just accepted why it always have to be a thing of like oh in order to in order for people to like get off my back of me to oh, never get off my back it feels like people are doing it just to seem like they're a good person it's not even coming from a real place it's not as if they're like trying to change the so not just trying to kind of um, strike a conversation in terms of the unfair beauty standards that exist in the fashion industry. It's just seems that they're just doing it to tick a box. Oh, let's get somebody that's got a disability tick, somebody that's got that's not white tick, somebody is fat tick, somebody is short tick, like somebody's missing one eye tick. It's not even done with any kind of love, appreciation, um, cons not even concern, gratitude, whatever. It's not done with any of that. It's just done because they want to seem as if they are good people. So it's basically a model version of a uh, of flipping. Um, it's a fashion version of fucking virtue signaling, right? Which basically makes me think of that kind of fake protest thing that um show that Karl Lagerfeld did back in the day with Chan with Chanel, which is kind of a bit of a genius masterstroke. And also makes you think of Karl Lagerfeld quote where he basically said one of the reasons why he decided to lose weight when he did lose weight that time was because he wanted to wear um Hedy Slamane designed Dior, I think back then, right? And he basically said, Yeah, it doesn't look good if you're fat. You basically have to get skinny and he basically lost a bunch of weight. You know, maybe it was all those young guys who was keeping around him, but in general, he ended up looking amazing in the clothes. And it was a bit of a crass comment, but it just is what it is. Like, there's no denying that certain clothes made by certain designers look better on a particular frame. And I just don't know why this, that isn't just a thing. And again, fashion itself, anyway, is a bit of a gross industry because, in general, they basically make you want to buy more things that you basically need every single season they basically make you desire and long for things that you possibly don't need possibly can't afford and that's possibly going to damage the environment and our world irreparably for generations to come but you justify it so i don't know how what people can't just suspend belief a little bit be like you know what that's how you want to kind of rep that that's fashion isn't representative of the real world it never has and never should be i feel like it kind of is a facet of it maybe it reflects one part but in terms of the idea that it should always represent every single person it just feels a little bit what's the point 
Do you know what I mean? You might as well just start making, designing clothes for fucking Matalan and shit if you want to address the world and shit. Um, but yeah, I kind of get where Heidi's kind of Kisamans came from. I understand his anger, um, especially again, like I said, considering the kind of complete pivot that they're going from, you know, having, you know, um, Emmanuel Alt leading the charge at Vogue Paris, which again, she doesn't, she can't have anything to complain about either because, you know, Vogue Paris towards the end was quite boring with Emmanuel Alt as a head. Um, the editorials were all the same. Um, it wasn't really fresh. She as a stylist, I felt like had hit a bit of a ceiling. Um, again, you know, it was a sad for me as well because I'm a big fan of hers. I, you know, I come up from that school or I come up from that generation where people were kind of idolizing editors and stylists more so than just bloggers hanging around the street and shit. And she seemed like pretty an interesting figure to kind of look at from afar. Like I said, she always seemed like she didn't really was that happy that people were taking pictures of her, but still. You know, there was a particular aesthetic that I was kind of in love with. And again, during that time too, she made Elizabeth, Isabel Marant shoes pop. Not pop, but like, I feel like Isabel Marant clothing basically popped a lot more when Emmanuel and the Alt wore it. She wore a few cardigans. Maybe she was consulting. I don't know at the time, but she did a lot for that brand. Um, and that was, again, was because of her street style and all that sort of stuff. So I can understand that might be a bit of a shock as well, that suddenly she woke up and she was out. I mean, you're out of the, you're out of the system. People don't want to people don't want people don't think your voice is valid they want new interesting voices now things that are more representative of the quote-unquote real world she's maybe somebody that comes from a very wealthy background you know like it's not something that people want to hear or see anymore it's just a very interesting place and again she doesn't really, she doesn't really do that many interviews either but i really wish to see or to hear what she has to say again the iconic look of a emmanuel in it the the what you call it the short jeans, the kitten heels, the leather jacket, the hair. Mm. Oh yeah, I remember this. I want to be a Reutfeld. Do you remember that? Crazy man, Emmanuel Alt. Yeah, that was part of the zine I think they put together. Um, that I think it was like an old Saglio zine. Somebody has that as well. Please let me know in the comments. I really want that zine if it's available. Anyway, the battery's gonna run out soon, so let me just stop talking about it and rambling. But yeah, um, I get it, man. It's amazing. I'm happy with Vogue. I'm not happy with Vogue. It is what it is, isn't it? It is what it is anyway that's the thing show episode number 531 thanks again for tuning in if you're listening to this for the first time if it's your second time then hi again i'm joking but yeah thanks again for listening to this anyway 531 i'm gonna upload this right now so if you're only listening to this on the podcast you'll hear a song after this if you're watching this on youtube it will end right there but thanks again for tuning in more things coming at your head top very soon gonna be banging out the content because why not there's nothing really to do right now because the world's gonna be closing and ending very soon so why not keep making the content but until then my friends take care be safe it was really great to hang and i'll see you guys again very soon peace